new year, the new you. Because when a person is saved, they're born again into God's family. They're given new life. They're given a new nature. Uh, they're given a new name. They have new desires, ambitions, goals. They have a new eternity. Everything becomes new. They have a new perspective on life. And uh, so that's what we're talking about, the new you. And uh, that is, uh, God actually does, he's, he's uh, it, just like in the original creation where he created man out of the dust of the ground, well, he's not recreating us like that, but spiritually he's recreating us in the image of his son, making us like him. And uh, so it is a restoration, a recreation of us. We are a new creation, that's why the word creation is used. The truth of the matter is, though, the new you isn't fully sanctified yet. Uh, you're not what you will be someday when we get to glory, but uh, if you're truly born again, if you've truly been saved, uh, if you're a child of God, then you're not what you used to be either. You are new, and things are just getting better and better, newer and newer. And so we looked at some of the Old Testament passages, excuse me, before we even get there. Uh, this is the, the struggle that we have. Uh, that the flesh, the flesh, the old man, lust against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, these are contrary to one another, so that you do not what you would. When, you, when you're saved, God puts in your heart, this new, the new heart, the new nature, and you have a want to. You have a want to be like Christ. You have a want to study the scriptures. You have a want to obey what God says. You have a want to walk in holiness. You have a want to do what's right, to do what's good, what's godly, what's obedient to the will of God. You have that want to, because God saves us from the inside out. The truth of the matter is, we also have a don't do. We just don't always do what we want to do spiritually. And uh, so we looked at the scriptures last week to see some of the Old Testament saints. Uh, did they struggle with this? And the interesting thing is that even in the Bible, some of the greatest men and women in the Bible, God's great chosen people, they also struggled with sin. Noah, the preacher of righteousness, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And yet no sooner did God save him and his three sons and their wives, the eight of them were the only ones left alive on planet Earth. You'd think, wow! They would just serve God perfectly from then on. No. Noah grew a vineyard. And uh, next thing we know, we find him drunk and exposed. And one of his sons apparently thought that was funny and paraded his dad's shame before his brothers. And what a mess. Abraham, the one whom God chose to save and then make the progenitor of the nation Israel from where the Jews have come from. Abraham, and he obeyed God, and by faith he went out and did exactly what God said. But no sooner did he get to the promised land, and there was a famine, and then he was afraid, and then he left the land, and he goes to Egypt, and then he tells, he tells his wife, Sarah, he says, you've got to lie for us here. Tell him you're my sister to save his own life. And, uh, and that wasn't the only time. He lied other times, too, he, uh, to uh, King Abimelech. Same thing. Tell him you're my sister, fearing for his life. And so, yes, he, uh, he demonstrated faith in God, justified a child of God, and yet there was the lies and the fears and the doubts. And then there was Lot. Remember Lot's wife? She turned into a pillar of salt. But, but Lot was a man who went to Sodom and lived in Sodom and became part of the community of Sodom and vexed his righteous soul. Yeah, if it weren't for the New Testament, we wouldn't even know he was righteous. Apparently he came and lived and compromised his life and it says that he lived in there among the ungodly people. So ungodly and wicked was Sodom that God destroyed that place. And God had to send an angel of the Lord to, to take him by the hand and literally drag him out of the city to save his life. He was a righteous man, and yet, by the way he lived, among the ungodly, he had hardly ever known it. And there was Jacob, one of the patriarchs. 
and to deceive his father. You know, he put on the, the hair, the wool, and, and, and he was a deceiver and a liar and a cheater. Struggled with fears and doubts. Moses, the great lawgiver, the great man of God leading Israel out of Egypt. <clears throat> and yet he was a murderer. And not only that, but he struggled with uh, anger <laughs> on a number of times. Ang he had anger issues. And impatience. He said, how can a man so godly and such a majestic man as, as Moses? And yet, you know, he had some issues. He had some baggage in the old life, the old flesh. Sins in his life too. And then Joshua, his assistant, the great leader, when Moses died, now God says, Joshua, you're going to take Israel into, into the promised land and conquer all these nations. And uh, they divvy up the land among the 12 tribes, remember? But Joshua didn't fulfill that. God says to him, you're now late in life. You're, you're now old. And you know what? A lot of the land has not been possessed. In fact, seven of the 12 tribes had not taken possession of their land. Maybe Joshua thought, unless I do it, nobody will do it. Or somehow he didn't lead the people into doing what they should be doing. And uh, interestingly enough, at the end of his life, it was a lot different. At the end of Moses' life, we read in Joshua 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua. But in Judges 1, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, who's going to go up for us? He has no successor. He failed to prepare for his exit. Gideon, oh, great judge, my favorite. 300 men destroyed the Midianites, and yet fears and doubts needed God's constant reconfirmation. Are you sure, Lord? Are you sure? Not to mention when he died, or just before he died, <coughs> he had a, built a 42-pound gold ephod. I don't know what the reason was for it. Maybe it was uh, self-esteem or pride. We don't know. But nonetheless, the children of Israel started worshiping that thing and uh, led the Israel into adultery, spiritual adultery, harlotry, idolatry. <clears throat> Not to mention that his many wives and concubine. Elijah, perhaps the greatest of all the prophets, the man of God, boldness went to Ahab. His prayer, we know. He prayed that it would not rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Elijah. And yet, and yet he had a spiritual burnout, an emotional breakdown. He struggled with. Depression, discouragement. He had a wish to die. God, leave me. Just take my life. Kill me. Jonah, another prophet of God. These prophets were very special, holy men of God. They were the mouthpiece of God. God would speak direct revelation through them. So that when they spoke, they actually spoke the very word of God. God called Jonah on a special mission to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel. And Jonah says, uh, sure, Lord. And he goes to a ship and gets on and goes the opposite direction, try to run from God. How does that work out, Jonah? And even after finally he did obey God and go, went to Nineveh and preached the gospel, he was angry with God for saving that city. He was angry at God for showing grace to sinners. And David, with his adultery and murder and perversion of justice, obstruction of justice, and oh my goodness, yet he was a man after God's own heart. And the kings of Israel, so many of them, it says that they did good in the sight of the Lord. And they did. Many of them were the children of God. They were a wonderful, godly people. And yet, their children, their families were a mess. There was lies and hypocrisy. And, and they would flee to Egypt or sign these treaties with other countries that were contrary to the will of God, were the exact opposite of what God said to do. How can that be? 
Well, the truth of the matter is that their new you isn't fully sanctified. They probably all had the want to do what's right all the time, but it didn't always happen. So we come to the New Testament and we would ask ourselves, well, the New Testament will expect the New Testament Christians behave a lot more godly than the Old Testament saints. I mean, after all, the New Testament, we have more scripture. We, we should know better than the Old Testament saints. And, and all the Old Testament saints, the reason God recorded all that information in the Old Testament, it says he that those were recorded for an example to us that we should learn not to do what they did or to do the good things they did, that they were an example to us. And so, surely we will know better now that we saw their, their mistakes. And besides, the, new, the Holy Spirit was poured out in the New Testament in some new ministries, baptism into the body of Christ. Surely the New Testament saints will be better off than the Old Testament saints. You know, one of the things I really love about the Bible is it's, well, it's 100% it's absolute truth. But part of that is that all the stories of the Bible are 100% accurate, uh, true accounts, personal, historical accounts of these people's lives. And unlike myths and legends and secular history and biased biographies and all these other hero worship type things, the Word of God, when it wrote a story about somebody, it never exaggerated the good. It never made up or fabricated stories that would embellish this person, nor did it ever cover up their sin. God's word was extremely accurate and said, yes, he was my child. He was one of these God-fearing men and, and, and this and that, and he did good, but it also records their, their sins. And uh, so that's, that's one of the neat things about the Bible, how accurate it does that. Uh, the New Testament saints, Christians, are just like the Old Testament saints in a number of ways. God chose them in eternity past too. They're called the elect. They're the chosen. They've been predestined from eternity past to be a child of God, to be the recipients of His grace, to have their sins forgiven. The Old Testament saints, just like the New Testament saints, are called. In other words, God's Spirit puts out a call, uh, not only through the uh, external Word of God, but uh, an invitation given, but the Spirit of God calls and draws people to Himself supernaturally, powerfully, effectively draws them to himself. And he convicts them of their sin so that they understand that they're a sinner before a holy God and they need their sin forgiven. And, and the Holy Spirit illuminates their eyes, their minds, so that, that they can read and study and, and know the will of God. Old Testament saints, just like the New Testament saints, are born again. Being born again, you know, isn't just a new phrase, something new that's happened in the last 25 years. Uh, the Old Testament saints were born again. And when Jesus said to Nicodemus, uh, you must be born again, and Nicodemus didn't understand that, Jesus said to Nicodemus, how can that be you being a ruler of the Jews and you don't understand this? They had the Old Testament scriptures. They should have known and understood about being born again. And that's how Old Testament saints became what we call saints, became children of God. They were born again, given a new nature, a new life by the Spirit of God. And Old Testament saints, just like New Testament saints, were granted faith to believe. It was a gift of God. And they also were enabled to behave godly and to pursue holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And they had the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, without which they could not do anything holy. They could never obey any of the scriptures. They could never know the will of God or do the will of God at all if that wasn't for the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. So, yes, the Old Testament saints had that, just like we do today and the New Testament scriptures. Well, let's look at some of these people in the New Testament. First of all, in Acts chapter 
2, we read about the early church. And it says in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 41, Acts 2, 41, this is, but this is the first church here in Jerusalem. Uh, Christ has died, he was crucified, buried, rose again the third day, 40 days later, ascended into glory. Ten days later, day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God was poured out, the, the church began. And uh, the uh, first church here in Jerusalem, and it says in verse 41, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now notice this, verse 44. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. There was persecution, there was famine, there was great need. And so when all these additional thousands of people had come to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost and gotten saved, put a burden on the church, but that's all right. The people in the church, they, they would sell extra stuff they had to help pay and, and provide for food if people had need. And then we go over to chapter 4 and verse 32 and we read about this. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who had, were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that, they were, that were sold. And they laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who's also named Barnabas by the, apostle, well, uh, by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so this was something a number of the people in the church were doing. And then it says in verse five, in chapter 5, verse 1, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his laugh. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. It was about three hours later when his wife came in, knowing, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yeah, yeah, that's it, for so much. And Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And then immediately she fell down at his feet, breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried, out, carried her out, burying her by her husband. Here we have a couple in the church, in the early church. I believe that they were truly saved, born again. And they, like other people in the church, there were so many needs. They said, you know what, we got an extra piece of land over here. We inherited it from Grandma, whoever, wherever they got it, we don't know. <coughs> we got this piece of property, and we're going to sell this and give the proceeds to the church to help out the people. I think they had the good want to. They had the right intention. And, and it was their property. They didn't have to sell it. And even after they sold it, and, and uh, maybe they were going to sell, sell it for 100 shekels. And, uh, but lo and behold, they got 110 shekels for it. And even what they got for it, it didn't matter what they got. Even the pros, that was all theirs. They didn't have to give anything to the Lord. But they had intended to. Maybe they got more than they thought they were going to get for the land. And so they said, well... We're going to give what we originally thought. We're going to just keep back that 10 shekels. We got more than we thought. We don't know what. But they lied. About it. They lied. They lied to Peter, to the Holy Spirit. 
Maybe it was greed. Maybe they get this 110 shekels or 100 shekels, whatever the weather got for the price of the land. They go, wow, <laughs> that's a lot of money. We don't need to give that. Let's keep some of that. After all, we could buy a new tent or whatever they lived in back then, mud hut. And, and maybe it was just greed that kind of swelled up in them and said, no, we're going to keep some of the money. That would have been okay too, right? They get all quiet about it. Maybe it was lack of faith. Maybe, you know, they get talking about that and how we sold the, sold the property. We got this money, but you know what? That was what we were kind of banking on for retirement. I don't know if God's going to be able to provide for us if we give this all. Maybe we better keep something. I don't know what it was, but they probably had the right want to to start with. And then it disintegrated, and they didn't do the follow-through. I think of the disciples. Yes, the, the apostles. The apostles. This is the foundation of the church. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2.20. It says that the church, it's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. These are the apostles of Christ. These are the ones that were handpicked by Jesus, who followed Jesus around. They were privy to all of his miracles. They saw him <coughs> crucified. They saw him resurrected. The, the apostles. These are the probably the most important, the most spiritual, the most godly of all people in the New Testament, right? These were the authors of Scripture. They themselves did miracles by the power of God. you think they ever sinned and messed up? Yeah. Oftentimes they exhibited little faith. If you go to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, verse 25, now verse 24, suddenly... Got in this boat to go across the Mediterranean and suddenly, or I go across the Sea of Galilee, I'm sorry. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with, uh, with the waves, but he, that is Jesus, was asleep. And the disciples came to him, awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? And he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who could this be? But even the winds and the sea obey him. Mm -hmm. They marveled. They were fearful. They, they were afraid. And just before this, if you read back in the early part of the chapter, he had just healed the centurion's son. He just healed Peter's mother-in-law. Then they were bringing him all sorts of people with all sorts of diseases. And he healed them all. He cast out demons from a demon-possessed person. He performed stupendous, awesome miracles, God-like, God-only miracles. And it was right after that that they get on a boat, and the storm comes up, and they're crying like a bunch of scaredy-cat babies. We're going to die! You didn't know? You didn't just see the Son of God, God Himself at work? What are you worried about? We go over to chapter 14. You'd think that that would have been enough. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 30. And now this is Peter. Peter jumps out of the boat to walk towards Jesus. Verse 29, let's start there. So he said, come. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Just before this, Jesus had fed 5,000 men plus women and kids. And what did he use to feed them? Two little fishes and five loaves of bread. We talk about loaves of bread. We're talking five little muffins, okay, of bread. And Jesus fed 
5,000 men plus women and kids, seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 people. And they gathered up the, the, the fragments that remained and there was 12 baskets. You do the math. <laughs> Peter, little faith. Why do you doubt? We go over to Matthew chapter 16. And uh, verse 7 says, They reasoned among themselves, saying, uh, It's because we've taken no bread. <laughs> There's another occasion. They go, Oh, no, we forgot to bring any bread. There's 13 of us now. There's the 12 of us and Jesus. 13. Oh, Jesus is going to be upset with us. He must be upset because uh, we forgot to bring food. And, and the 13 of us, what are we going to do? How thick do you think these guys were? He'd already fed 5,000, well, 7, 8, 9,000 people. On another occasion, he fed 4,000 and some men, plus women and kids, with seven loaves. And now they think that Jesus is, oh, what are we going to do? There's 13 of us, we got nothing to eat. Are you kidding me? Oh, ye of little faith, verse 8. Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O ye of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the four of the four thousand and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand? But I did not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The, the passage over in Mark, it says that Jesus said this, for they, had not un, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hard. Their heart was hardened. So, so here we have these disciples of little faith. They were doubting. They were fearing at times. They were worried about 13 of us eating. God has already provided food for 5,000, 4,000, many thousands, and they gathered baskets remaining. And it says because their heart was hardened. You know, that's, that's really amazing. We're talking about the disciples here now. We've been traveling with Jesus and seeing all these miracles. And Jesus says they didn't understand because their hearts were hardened. It's the words of Jesus. Not only did there, were they dull, a lack of attention, lack of focus here, but it says their hearts were hardened. And I think it goes beyond an inability to understand. It's that there was a refusal. There was some type of a, I'm not going to believe it. Isn't it amazing how believers can sometimes have so little faith? We are believers. We have believed Christ and He's our Savior. And yet so often we just can't trust Him. How can that be? Well, just like the disciples. Little faith. In Matthew 26, I'm running out of time here, so we have to go hurry here. In Matthew 26, uh, Jesus said, uh, I want the disciples that He had... The Peter, James, and John come out and pray with me in the garden. This is just before he was crucified. He said, watch and pray. In other words, stay awake, stay alert, and pray with me. And he comes back, and what happens? They were sleeping. I'm in Matthew 26. Uh, it's verse 69. Uh, no, let's see what verse is it. 36. And, and Jesus says, pray with me, watch. And, and what? They're falling asleep. And he wakes them up and he says, pray with me. He comes back a little while later and they're, they're falling asleep again. What does Jesus say? The flesh, or the, the, the spirit is indeed willing, right? They had the want to, but the flesh is weak. The old flesh drags them down. And they're sleeping when Jesus was there asking them to pray. How about at the cross? Or even before they were there and, and he, he kissed Jesus and betrayed him. And he says, 
Matthew records this. Mark records it. All the disciples forsook him and fled. We're getting out of here. And they ran. And then he rose from the dead. And they didn't believe that either. These were the disciples. I, uh, and Thomas particularly. Refusing. I, said, I will not believe unless I can feel and see it myself. And put my hands in the scars of his hands and in his side. I will not believe it. Unbelievable. They're a lot like us, aren't they? Or should I say they're just like us? How about Peter? They've taken Jesus away now and he's being tried by the Sanhedrin. And Peter's outside in the gate, in the foyer there, or wherever, warming his hands by the fire. And the girl says, you're one of them, aren't you? No, 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 I had no, I had no idea. I never met with the guy. I don't know him at all. Swore up and down. I do not know the man. Three times he denied that he knew Christ. Vehemently. Peter. By the way, he wasn't the first, first pope. <laughs> Not only did he have a mother-in-law, but anyways, we'll get into that. But here's Peter. Again, one of the inner three of the apostles of Christ. Vehement deny, vehemently denying he even knew Christ. How about John Mark? We usually refer to him just as Mark. His name was uh, John Mark. Uh, he's the author of the Gospel of Mark in the Bible. But we read about him in, in Acts. Acts chapter 15. This was the first missionary journey. And uh, Paul and Barnabas, they're commissioned by the early church at Antioch, commissioned by God, sent out by the Holy Spirit. Uh, to go on this missionary journey to establish these churches, and John Mark went with them. But you know what? About halfway through this mission trip, John Mark says, I'm out of here. And he skedaddled. It says here, uh, chapter 15, verse 36. Some days after Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we've preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. He deserted them. And the apostle Paul says, no way, he's not going with us. Paul, the Apostle Paul, didn't think this young man, Mark, was worthy of a second chance. Whatever he did, whether he was a mommy's boy or he got scared or he got sick, Paul took it as he's a deserter. He's not getting a second chance. Now, the neat thing is, when Paul was just about to die prior to his, cruci uh, prior to his execution, the last chapter in, in, that Paul wrote, 2 Timothy chapter 4, before his execution, he says, get Mark. <laughs> get John Mark and bring him with you, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So he was... But nonetheless, how about Paul and Barnabas? That same passage, the next verse. Isn't this something? Paul and Barnabas... Two men commissioned, called of God, ordained to go out and establish these churches. They traveled to establish these churches on their first missionary journey. But it, it says there, after Paul insisted that they would not take him, verse 39 says, Then the contention became so sharp, that is between Paul and Barnabas, the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. This was not an amicable breakup. This was a sharp contention. This was a, a, a terrible disgrace. Can you imagine that? That there was such stubbornness 
such irreconcilable differences that they split asunder. No, God used that. God knows all this, and God had Silas ready for Paul to join up with, and, and, uh, and later on, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I think it is, that, uh, that, that Paul and Barnabas were reconciled and served again together uh, when they were at Corinth. Uh, but, but these things happen. And, and over in Galatians chapter 2, I won't turn there, but in Galatians chapter 2, Paul uh, finds out that, uh, that uh, Barnabas was playing a hypocrite. No, I'm sorry, Peter. Peter was playing a hypocrite. And Paul had to confront him face to face because he was, he was wrong. He was in the wrong. And Paul confronts Peter with his hypocrisy. And it says that Barnabas also was carried away with this hypocrisy. And because of that, they led many other Jews into hypocrisy. <laughs> Unbelievable. These are the apostles, the disciples, men of God. Yes, they have the want to, but you know what? Sometimes they don't do. We can look at the first century churches, the ones that were established by Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and Titus, and they were pastored by these church, by these men of God. These were the best churches. We read about them here. And you know what? Every letter that Paul sends to one of these churches, the churches that are made up of Christians, they have problems. You can read about, particularly in the Corinthian letters, or you can read in Revelation 2 and 3 where Jesus himself sends a letter to the seven different churches. And every one of those churches had problems. There was doctrinal deviation and error, there was apathy, there was, there was selfishness, lovelessness, lukewarmness. How can that be? Because of the cunning and craft of our spiritual enemies, the pressures of the world, and our old flesh. So that we don't have the want. This is why. And by the way, we're not justifying, we're not tolerating and condoning and saying, well, it's okay to sin because everybody does it. No, it's still sin. It's wrong. And a Christian should not want to ever tolerate it. The Christian has a new nature, and his new nature says, I don't want to do that. My spirit, the spirit of God, my inner spirit, my nature wants to do what's holy, what's right all the time. I don't always do it, but I want to. I hate sin. And that's what Paul said in Romans chapter 7. What I will to do, what I want to do, wish to do, desire to do, I don't always practice that. But what I hate, I do. But the true Christian has that want to. Inside, he always wants to live godly and holy. He hates sin. He doesn't like sin. Though he finds that he does it sometimes. So what do we do? Well, we cry out to God for forgiveness, for cleansing. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And second, we beseech God for strength and victory. <laughs> it's obvious we can't live this perfect life on our own. We need thee every hour. I need the Lord's strength. I need victory from on high. And so I pray for victory. I pray for strength. I pray God direct me. I pray, Lord, lead me around the temptation. Lord, lead me not into temptation. No, Lord, help me to avoid these things. We cling to one another. That's what God, that's what a church is all about. <coughs> The brethren standing together, praying for one another, supporting, encouraging, loving one another. That's what fellowship is. We get to know each other and stand alongside one another. I don't care what your problem is. You say, well, I got some problems. I got some sin in my life I'm ashamed of. You don't need to be ashamed of it. We all got sin in our life. We're here because of God's grace 
We're here to help one another claim the victory and get on. And then we resolve to persevere, to get up when the world and Satan knocks us down and keep going. Pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. If you're truly a Christian, you're not going to let sin get you down. You're going to conquer it, and you're going to go on for Jesus' sake. Heavenly Father, thank you for these lessons from your word. That even these great people, men and women in those scriptures, struggled with sin just like we do. Lord, we hate sin, and we don't want it to be a part of our lives. And so we come to you and confess it. And we ask for victory. We ask you to give us strength and the gumption to overcome it. That we might walk holy. That we might be faithful servants for you. That we might be used of you. Let our light shine and draw others to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to just sing one verse quickly of hymn number 308. Hymn number 308. Just one verse. I'm pressing on the upward way.